Good morning and welcome. This is Dr. T. Tavo DRC, the Apostle over the DFW Leader Online Ministry Fellowship. We give our ministry greetings and invite you to participate, whether you are from this nation, another nation, whether you're a Christ follower, a believer in Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, or not. Yet we want to say you're welcome, you're accepted, we befriend you in the name of the good Lord Jesus Christ. However, we give our comments directly to the Christian fivefold offices and the believers because some of our words are pretty strong and we want them to know that it is for them that everyone else is welcome to listen. And then we invite everyone who participates to see law. That means pause, think about it really, what does it really mean deeply. And then if you feel the leading of the Lord, the nudging of the Lord, then to check it out and see if it really lines up with the Bible. That way you'll be an honored, noble Berean. That's how we operate with other people's good teaching and their doctrines as well. We submit this teaching, everything, to you, uh, whether it's correcting, whether it's edifying, comforting, strengthening, reproving, whatever. We submit it to you as sila, not dogma. And the fruit of this ministry, we hope, will be one that remains, and that would be abiding relationships in all kinds of people, all colors of people, all belief systems of people, in our submitted James 3.17, that any wisdom, all wisdom that truly comes from above, is first of all pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And I'm trying to abide by that on and off the screen. You can see our picture today. There's two things. One is there is the quadrants of the many different kinds of grassroots, middle income, people who are in ministry, the people they affect, the people they bump into in their relationships, whether they're at home, out at the grocery store, out at the gas pump, in their house, in the fellowship, and in the local church. And so we respect you to have your own opinion, but we also expect you to you know, have common doctrine that we could all get a, agree on. And then when we rub off as a witness, as to another person, be a friend, that it would wind up in a James 3.17 relationship of real respect for all kinds of people, real office respect, real junior ministry respect, respect well, all kinds of believer respect for the office of every human being made in God's image, which is Psalm 139. Today our topic is going to be on the spirit of power and might, the Holy Spirit power and might, as well as the supernatural side, but also the power over self, personal self-government. Many people are made in God's image because God is no formula. He's not a template. He's not a, he doesn't want clones. We don't really understand his whole, whole image. We know that he represents himself in the diverse colors of the different nationalities, their people groups, their DNA. We also know that when people talk of God's spirit of power and might, it may come across as a reminder of former things that were not pleasant with people who were dominating individuals or persons who had personalities which were not perceptive or genuine or had a certain you know entitlement or was not that would run roughshod over your feelings because they didn't discern the relationship boundaries in a mature fashion. We apologize for those people. We don't want to be among those people. So now we're going to teach on the power and might, maybe in multi-levels, for you to pick and choose. You can see our picture of power and might represented at the bottom with the praying Savior intercedes on our behalf. There he is, the fivefold office senior minister of all the church that was to come. And there he is symbolically interceding for us laying down his life for each one of us on this earth and also bowing in humble submission in a relationship with his father like he had every day, a first love lifestyle of genuine humility, genuine strength and personal self-government, all fivefold office mantled authority under personal self-government, God control, the fruit of the spirit, which is Galatians 5, and 23, love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, goodness, and self-control. You can have a lot of teaching on authority, which is out there available right now around every corner, but not many people are teaching on personal self-government, having your way submitted to the Lord and then letting him help you govern and guide you and guard you in all kinds of relationships, whether it's in ministry, 
whether it's personal, whether it's in authority, your office, out into the field, in relationships. Like you say, when you're buying things at the grocery store, you bump into people. You could either project the acceptance, the love of Christ, or you could project rejection, accusation, hatred, murder, or whatever, contempt, or superiority. People are not, not immune to being perceptive. Now more than ever, heightened sensitivity out in the media, heightened sensitivity because of all, in, all the deep injustice around the world, the murders, the racists, the riots, all these things going on. People in prisons every day, every level of society is fully charged now with this awareness of being super sensitized. So we must uh, realize that people are going to be watching out, could be watching out and perceive your your disrespect is that you are really their enemy. So we want to be really cautious and wise and be available to personal self-government. We point out to the Christian, we say that everyone now is in global ministry. Just turn on your television, just turn on your YouTube, just turn on your your uh, internet, and you know that the nations are coming to us. They're coming toward us, and you can either be a joyful person and be ready and be prepared and be equipped emotionally and spiritually and and your biases and bigotry all gone, having the power of God's spirit and might, his Holy Spirit and might, like Jesus had because he came from the Middle East. You want to think about these things outside the usual box of tradition of the last 20, 30 years in this nation or in any nation. It's not the same old, same old. So we're going to teach on some things today, give you some some Bible scriptures to look up and to remember about the spirit of power and might. Yes, the spirit, spirit of power and might through the eyes of the New Testament church came fully in the different peoples that were gathered in the 120 in the upper room in Acts 2 and went out from there and the church started to multiply. However, so did the opposition, so did the greatness of God, but so did the strange kind of doctrines that would try to come in and warp the true message of the faith uh, in Jesus Christ, about the relationship, the pure-hearted relationship of Christ following, which is really to say that you must be born again to get to perceive the kingdom of God at work and in action, get your prayers answered fully in this present age, but also to make sure you get in, that your name is still kept in the Lamb's Book of Life for all eternity, that there is a heaven to gain, a hell to avoid. The thread of eternity is really a deep part in everything I teach about relationships, the purposes of Christ following the purposes of ministry. Let everyone else go about and do their own thing and add other things, mingle it with the law, put everyone back under the law, teach on covering, teach on whatever. That is their false hope, but that is their choice. We're going to try to teach minus... Uh, the law, minus Old Testament roles, minus Old Testament legalism, things stuck in our craw against other nations, other kinds of people. And we're going to try to always watch out for our own quality of Christ falling personally, that it's based on real respect for everybody else, whether they're male or female, toward, tall or short, thin or fat, young or old, that's without respect or persons, no raci racism. In fact, we do not tolerate and allow or want racists to come into our fellowship and be on our team. It is by God's goodness I say this. I want to clarify that I, I need to honor, that I, if I, I would fail if I did not honor all the persons, males and females in my family that were Christians, in my role models through the years of Christian leaders and fellow servant leaders, but also males and females in pastoral ministry, prophetic ministry, without legalism. I thank them for different people who gave me counsel, held me accountable. I appreciate and respect all those people. And if I had not have had good nurturing and, and people who are not arrogant when I could ask questions, people that were not all-knowing, I appreciate those people because they were open and true and truly just servant leaders that one could iron sharpens iron with, get counsel from time to time, get advice. And I thank God for wisdom and balance that has kept me and preserved me, starting with my father, senior pastor, uh, up in up in the heaven with the Lord. And now my mother has recently joined to be up there with them, as well as grandmothers and aunts, all these people who influenced me 
plus some still alive today, many still alive. Nobody today could say that we've made it. Nobody could say today we've got it all. Nobody could say we, we understand it all, especially about God's power and might. It is only through the grace of God, through his gift, that he allows me to speak on this. And so therefore, I want to honor all of you who know a lot about it, probably even more what I know, and I want to share for your own Selah, that maybe you can use some of it for kernel teaching, doctrine, uh, enhancement, and give the idea of how to get back out from under that Levitical patriarchism, matriarchism that is squelching the vigor, the dynamite Holy Spirit release, because it's putting things back under form, house rules, it, uh, it accuses, it breeds critical Levitical, and it, it has even places that is a beration of Christ following without valuing relationships, such as avoiding relationship verses in ministry, such as Matthew 18, 15 through 17, about respectful one-to-one -one upfront confrontation instead in certain groups, certain kinds of groups, Throughout the nation, you'll find this, this I call it a berate without a berate without relate. You don't know them. You're not, they're not under your ministry. They're not married to you. You're minding their business, and then you feel entitled. Some of you feel entitled to go out and rebuke somebody openly, accuse them unjustly, and then abuse God's witness, abuse your spiritual authority. We've been there three times. Therefore, we caution people now that God is not settling for second or third class citizen uh, servanthood like he used to <laughs> citizenships. He went in second citizenship in the heaven of God, in the, in the eternal things of God, the kingdom of God. So let's, with all this said, let's move on to our topic today. Our topic is that we want to hear from God. We want to help you hear from God. You and your your part of the turf, you and your personality, your own organic value to the Lord, your own organic ministry call, and then you weed out the hay, please, and pick out what's stubble and see if there is a word of the Lord within that. I'm going to move our picture of the Christ, the intercessor, because it takes a lot of strength to be quiet under pressure. It takes a lot of strength to resist the temptation to be all-knowing and all-wise, to be superhuman, super strong, or to think you're too, you know, that you've arrived. It takes strength to be humble. Therefore, we value and count as one of our many blessings we've noted in the Christ followers, the quiet pillars of strength who don't have a lot of fame or fortune, but they're there uh, really holding up people with their prayers in the prayer closet. Mothers and fathers, grandmothers. Makes me get a tear from my eye, a joyful tear. That all the people who are quiet, the very quiet unsung heroes who've had to grow up and know God's power and might. Because many of many of them really are alone to the Lord. They have a lot of, you know, some of them are grandmothers. I know so many of these people through the years in different states. So I honor those people as pillars in so many houses of the Lord. Let me get a drink of water. <laughs> so let's remove this picture so we can focus on what's really going well and what's not going well in the grassroots. Grassroots is where they're at the grocery store, where they open the door for you or don't, whether they smile and greet you or they're self-absorbed where they, they shun you and avoid you because of your color, of your skin, your size, your look, or typecast you, or stereotype you, or uh, spread rumors about you, or treat you with respect and make you want to go back and visit a second, third, or even join time. So whatever starts at the top on a media level goes through many changes, even challenges today because of the different kinds of things down at grassroots, mixture, fads and fancies, big eyes, little U's, different doctrines that come through affected by the TV culture, what people take that might be really, as I've said this phrase, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. The one at the top on the national broadcast, the global ministry may say everything right, they have their heart right, they act together, and they are not responsible for what goes on with the person in their lazy boy, the easy chair, the people who are uncomfortable with it or who are just 
using license or licentiousness that have no love or maturity. So the need to teach is both. To teach, I teach both. I teach, <laughs> I teach uh, upward and downward. I teach leader who are whoever's ears to hear. I call it a zoom like Google Earth. You zoom out to see the wide expanse of the greatest fathom of ministry, and then you zoom in to the real deal down at the bottom of the, you know, down in the local ministry where their feet are on the ground, and you know that they're hurting. A lot of people are hurting, and where are they hurting? Usually, generally, about relationships, immature relationships, relationships gone wrong, people mistaking Christ following, mingling with law, then there's backbiting or things that hurt relationships affect Christ following, ruin the Hebrews 10.25 injunction to fellowship with the saints. So we are for God's people. We are for fellowshipping with the saints. We're just for winnowing out what would destroy the purposes or the look of, you know, the following of Christ so that it's safe for God's people to fellowship on a long-term basis. We know because we fellowship for 60-some years around with the body. When I was a pastor's, pastor's firstborn child. However, in the last few years, because of the grassroots, whatever's going on out there, TV culture set in its ways, the Lord relieved me from my servant leader of studying and being with the saints for 40 years, and now I've been happily since 2012 working on the pioneering this work online. And you can see that many people have found it, even though we've not advertised it or been aggressive. We just put it out there, and the Lord is building as He wants. We want to have it on land, but I'm not going to settle for some of this stuff that's on grassroots turf. All these people have been sitting under great ministries, but a lot of people are setting their ways out in the ranks because they aren't taught relationships. Or they, or they've been stifled because you know they're sort of back under the law, and there's really not a lot of might and power. It's sort of like you have to walk so carefully. It's like people have no vigor, no gumption, and so we just can't be around a lot of people pleasing. It isn't healthy. I wrote up there a blog. It's called manpleasingministry.wordpress.com. Manpleasingministry.wordpress.com is what I wrote a few years ago because I was. Just little observations. You may have to dig back. It was published, I think, online 2014, something like that. But it's up there still for you to read. At Misadventures in Human Pleasing is the long title, the official title of it. If we look for the spirit of power and might, let's pray. Let's pray for God's help. Lord, we love you. We need you. We acknowledge you that we need your help in even conveying this message. Lord, we ask that you help us to heed, to discern what it is that you want said, and heed and discern what it is that is really correct to hear and take in, and then help us avoid things that are not of you, that are not loving. Lord, we give you praise and honor, and we thank you for joying. Give us that joy of the Lord that is our strength today on our journey. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're looking around the survey. We can survey the lay of the land, the lake of fire, <laughs> the lay of the land by looking at the nightly news on trying to get away from by just scanning the internet for some headlines and then you're hit full force with what is not going very well. I advise now to pull back, that we need to pull back and focus like a Google Earth again, just zoom out, see what's going on so you can pray, hear God, take action and then zoom in and look at what Examine what is going so well. Train your children, too. These children have never, you were grown up, most of you grew up with let things going very peacefully and blessed. You need to really, we need to really guard our children, the older children, everybody, from getting too much over information, which can only harm. So no matter what goes on or what doesn't, by the time I give this message, no matter what disaster or what hasn't, there's still the principle that when you're abiding in the vine, the true living vine, Jesus, in your relationship, the Holy Spirit is there, the comforter, you'll be fine. Abiding in the vine, even online or not online, things can go just fine. When you focus, give your attention, your priority to balance. Zooming out, don't be immune, don't be ignorant. 
zoom in, hear what's going right, perceive all the things, even if you can only see, oh look, I can see with my eyes we have good clean paint on our wall, then start right there and give thanks. If you're one that loves to think about how bad things are or, or blame other people or feel bad about yourself on a regular basis too often, then you might want to pick, choose to pick a person around the world, one of those groups that you see online that is going through worse, horrible stuff and start praying for them when you feel tempted to feel self-pity, when you feel tempted to accuse or blame shift all right, onto others. Just rise up and human up and go after something. Make something positive out of it. So there's some things right now that we can do, and that's equipping right there. When I think of the Holy Spirit power and might, as we have said, we're trying to stay, we teach cross-denominationally. We teach from, levit from liturgical to fallen out under the power kinds of folks out there because they're all in between faith and prophetic and power and meek and quiet and complacent and joyful and all kinds, all colors. So we're letting you know this because we've understood, you know, what we get is some people are really offended, horrified, and shocked at the talk of Holy Spirit power. Some people have been around it and they never want to be and they've seen and they've been blamed for not being like that. So there are so many relationships that confuse God's book. We're just putting this out. We're saying there's no room to be complacent. Better to be hot or cold than lukewarm, God says in Revelation 3.16, or I'll just spew you out. But other than that, we can focus on what's going well. So if you want to pick how to talk about the spirit of power and might, because it's so needed, if you are feeling feeling too weak or drained or, you know, whatever, not pro things that aren't going well, you need more power, then there's some scriptures we want to give you today to dwell on, to think about, to pray, to meditate, to believe, put your faith in so that it will grow in you. We believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in praying in tongues in a prayer language. That helps me a whole lot, always has since I was a junior in college. However, I was, I was always one that was quiet and very perceptive, and it was always bothering me when people were not perceptive on the other side that were bombastic or too dominating or controlling with that gift. So I can, that's why we're trying to make it so easy that people can feel no pressure. You don't have to do it. I won't fuss if you don't do it. It's between you and the Lord. But it is advisable, and it helps me with my Holy Spirit power, plus praising a lot. But I want to get a build to that. In discussing the power of might, which is in the Bible, we can look at two places. We can look at the thread of that power from God in the garden creating to the world that was formed, and then the different prophetic and different miracles going through Moses and the Shekinah glory and God was always there and the axe head floated in the Old Testament. But then we get down to the nitty gritty of how does it pertain to the to us today and that would be New Testament times for Christians. And we look at the book of Acts, of course. We look at the miracle virgin birth of both Jesus and John the Baptist and we say there are things that do happen outside of our logic outside of our framework of normalcy. There are things when God interjects supernaturally, and that's the time of day we live in. We look at the picture of the Messiah, our other verse besides the book of Acts and those miracles that happen with Jesus' miracles in the New Testament. We also look at Isaiah 11 too, the picture of the coming Messiah, where it talks about that the Messiah would come filled with God's seven spirits. If I were to pick a very practical scripture for the power of might, I would use that as a springboard for those who are really don't understand or don't want to go about the Holy Spirit, the supernatural side. Yet I would caution those kind of people using a scripture that Christ used, Jesus used in the New Testament when he spoke to the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't want to think about the supernatural side of things. So Jesus rebuked them, and he said to them one day in Matthew 24, 22, 29, he said, You err. Plain old flat out, he told the whole group, bunch of them, You err, not knowing the scriptures 
or the power of God or the supernatural power of God. So you got to know both. You got to know the logos. That means all the, you know, basic about the Bible for its facts and history perspective. You need to know the rhema. That means how the Lord ignites certain verses that will jump out at you to build your faith, stand on his promises, how his word works, how faith operates, and then the different things in the Bible that would help you build up your faith and courage and stay strong. Yet also when it says know the power of God, that would mean the Holy Spirit, the things we're talking on, the gifts of the Spirit, moving of the Spirit, being led, basically being led by the inward witness, the peaceful, calm, and presence of the Holy Spirit guidance based on your daily relationship, based on God's grace, not earning it, not deserving it, not performing it, but just being given God's grace and mercy as a present help in time of need, so to speak, to hear every day how to navigate the waters of this life. Isaiah 11, 2 is a great one for renewing your mind. Part of the learning about the Bible is the fact that we, our brains are weary. Our brains are world educated. Our brains are out there absorbed with family and personal issues and money and building and media and you name it and fear comes in or doubt comes in or heavy oppression loads come in so we need to take what God has to renew our mind to get rid of those defrag our, our brains of wrong doctrine wrong thinking oppression being too tired and then letting the Lord you know let, really would make us narrow-minded so we wouldn't know all the things that are given to us by the freely giving Holy Spirit, including wisdom, power, God's power and might to navigate every single day your circumstances. I'm looking up Isaiah 11 2, <clears throat> pardon me, and it talked about how that not from, Jesus did not descend from the tribe of Levi. If you read the roots of Levi, the bitter roots of that tribe that was filled with uh, betrayal, animosity, violence from a chaotic, dysfunctional Levi raised between two fighting mothers and his mother Leah was not the favored mother by his father so there was rejection. So hallelujah that generational iniquity did not come down through Mary toward Jesus so that we're not bound by that. Jesus was not part of the tribe of Levi, he was part of the tribe of Judah which means the plowing agricultural servant leader side, but it also means Judah shall plow, plow up people's thoughts and minds when Jesus comes. When he comes, he plows up our hearts and minds, break up that fallow ground. But then he also, Judah means praise. It can also mean to praise, the tribe of praise. Hallelujah. So we look at the the way God used stealth. You know, many people don't think, I often think now when we see mo movies and videos, all the things, DVD, science fiction, how a lot of people understand how it can be to be transported, go to other galaxies, parallel universes, and all this stuff, and yet maybe they can't f quite fathom how God could have a creation, virgin birth, call things that are not as though they were, have a supernatural side, and then they can look at the Bible in a dim fashion. Oh, it's dry. Oh, it's hist oh, dull. I can't understand it. Well, right now I look back and I think, what if sin hadn't happened in the garden? The first humans hadn't permitted sin. Maybe that they'd had wireless right back then. If you look back at the possibility potential for all the things that we know now that they could have had many times, thousands of years earlier, if the our brains and life and relationships and anger and hurt and that communication with God had not been nipped in the bud maybe we wouldn't have all this stuff all that pride you know blocking things who knows that's one reason I love to go to the switch over to 1 Corinthians 2 9 and 10 and talk about these supernatural things and the get in the power of God get a rhema word I love to hear from the Lord and think big I don't think small because Paul said, and we can look at that through the eye of eternity as well, the end time, the future. Paul said from his perspective back thousands of years ago in first chronic first excuse me, first Corinthians two, nine and ten, he said back then, 
eye has not seen, ear has not heard, those things which the Lord has prepared for those who love him, but those things are revealed, that means they're perceived inwardly, they're revealed by the Spirit, for the Spirit, Holy Spirit, searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. Yes, there could be calamity. Yes, there could be horrible, horrible things going on. But do you want to get drawn and sucked down into that as a leader, as a family member? No. You want to keep your perspective. But the big perspective I keep is that, uh, yeah, it's horrible, but that's what Revelation said would happen. And then we're only here for a while. We're on our way. We're passing through. We're going to be in heaven forever. That's when I talk about eternity and the future. And I has not seen. And if, if they can capture the idea that, you know, like space travel, Star Trek, going where no man has gone before. <laughs> if they could see that from the secular point of view, how come we can't got, haven't we had got a little bit more to think about and to tell our children and to plan for the hope of this future. And if it doesn't happen, if Jesus comes first, it still happens for us. It's even better. It'll only get better and bigger. So let's go back for the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits flickering, eternal, there before the creation began, there as creation began, there in eternity, there sort of dulled down, because of an iniquity on the earth, in this temporal planet, it's the book of Acts. It's the power for the resurrection. It's the power for the quickening and healing of our mortal bodies. It's the staying power over the accuser of the brethren and the sistren in Revelation 12, verse 11. But I'm sort of jumping. I mean, it gets me so excited. Because you don't hear a lot of it. It's so toned down now. A lot of people tone that down. They don't talk about this kind of thing in their messages now. So we're having revival online. We're into the power and might all summer and longer as the Lord leads us. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, it says, Out of the, let's see, and there shall come forth a rod, that means a ruler, symbolically, a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. That's David, King David, Prophet David, the Psalmist David's branch, his side of the family. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Who's him? The Messiah, the Jesus, the non-accuser Messiah. It said the Spirit of the Lord, that's one of the spirits of God. One of the seven spirits will rest upon him, the Spirit of God. That's one. The spirit of wisdom, that's two. The spirit of understanding, that's three. The spirit of counsel, that's four. The spirit of might, that's five. The spirit of knowledge, that's six. And the fear of the Lord. You mean Jesus had the fear of the Lord? Yes, the honored, the holy, abiding fear of the, of the Lord. That humility. So we can look at the picture of the seven spirits of God, and we can see that Jesus Christ was no wuss. He was no milk toast. He was no weak need, and he wasn't always, as many conveniently want to picture him, the infant baby. He was also the full-blooded, real man, and he walked about in an earth suit of a Mediterranean, uh, excuse me, Middle Eastern Jew in the middle of all that goes on in the spiritual realm, the natural realm, and the crossroads of the nation of Israel where his ministry was. If you've ever been there like I have, you can know it's a hotbed just by entering in there, the spiritual warfare in that zone, and that's where he lived and ministered, yet he was never an accuser. He never had pride, and it said that all these seven spirits, even though they were on the inside of his his outer court earth suit, the, Medi the Middle Eastern earth suit, Jesus' Middle Eastern earth suit held this stealth power inside, but it wasn't with, wrapped up with a big ego, a giant need to, pro you know, say, I am here, you know, all this super serious stuff. And he wasn't a finger pointer. He wasn't that kind of minister. It said that the seven spirits inside, that were inside the the Christ growing up into the man of the area, the minister, 
It said in verse 3 of Isaiah 11, 2, and it shall make him, all these shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He was a discerner, seer, prophet to the max. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, nor reprove after the hearing of his ears. Even with his prophetic powers, his ability to stare, you know, look at somebody and know something because God would talk to him about that person, who they were from the inside, what about them. He never used that to accuse, to judge, to criticize, to spread gossip. He wouldn't tail bear or even believe the wicked report. That is power and might. If you look over through the many things that happen when Jesus is born, and then a portrayal of Christianity today by too many folks, then we can look and see that the biggest thing that I believe that came against Jesus, that comes against you and me now, and fellowshipping with the saints now, is the accuser. The accuser of the brethren, the leader, in, the mother, in, the sister, in, the children, the spouse, whatever it is, the government, whatever. And Jesus Christ though it's not well known. You you know what? I got my Bible. I got the wrong Bible. <laughs> I have my Bible that is my favorite and it lost the last half of the book of Revelation. I'm going to walk in here and get my other Bible. Oh, dear. But anyway, so what happened is when Jesus came, it wasn't just this sweet baby... with how Jesus modeled his ministry with all the relationships around that area, whether it's ministry relationships, personal relationships, private family relationships, Pharisee relationships, government, non-believers. We can read Jesus' relationship power, supernatural might and power under pressure, under mighty accusation to never lose his tongue, to never bite back, fight back. And we can see that in all the relationships listed in the Gospels. The Gospels means good news, and they're called the Gospels, not the gossips. The Gospels are when Jesus was alive in ministry, like I said, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read those from Phariseeism. They'll deliver us from legalism back under the law type of thing. If we focus on the relationships. If we focus on real respect for all kinds of people, whether they have an office or not, whether they are over us or not, whether they are the president or not, whether they are, <laughs> and then look at the, look at the 10 relationships at the top and the side of most of my blogs, especially on onlinefellowship.us. For the power of, the need for God's power and might when our relationships, all those everyday relationships get under big pressure. That's what brings me from the power of Isaiah 11.2, the power of might, over to Revelation 12, where it says to the church, we already win over the accuser, over the deceiver. Starting with the relationships with God forming Adam and Eve, everything was happy, hunky-dory, peaceful and calm. Everything was thriving, not just surviving, no backbiting, no overeating, nothing was going wrong. But then guess who? Something happened. The war in heaven happened, and there was the fighting between the mutiny, Lucifer, the former Beelzebub, the former worship leader up in heaven who'd gotten envious and rivalrous, created mutiny, and he comes down to earth. I'll read you Re Revelation 12 about that in a minute. But he comes down to earth in Genesis 3, as the accuser, as the serpent who twisted things and started to accuse, getting deceit going by accusing God to Eve, and then Eve was deceived and Adam willfully participated, and it went down from there. Relationships and the earth and everything, the darkness, started to try to come back and overtake, and only God and his different methods from the Old Testament law, his people, and the people that chose faith in him 
to stand for him could keep preserve it like salt even up to this time now i'm presenting all this as my opinion as the the sila from this house but let's look at the power and might the staying power of might in relationships because every war every divorce every curse word every abuse every betrayal every fighting every bullying would stop if the people each one took it ownership about getting their heart right their self-control their self-government their real respect their power to to govern their own lips their fists their hands their money from the lord with his holy spirit power and might revelation 12 Okay, I'm going to start with seven. And there was a great war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels, but prevailed not. Neither was their place found in heaven anymore. That's what we talked about, Satan being kicked out, the deceiver from heaven. Verse nine, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. How much of the world? The whole world, all right? He was cast out onto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Before they came down, it was organic. It was pure. It was trustworthy. It was no fighting. It was everything was provided for. There was no darkness. There was no curse, all right? However, however, he was cast down, and the two people who had been put in spiritual authority over him starting with the firstborn man adam he was the one first given the the commission do not eat of that told it not eat of that first tree before eve was formed it says in genesis 1 genesis 2 but because of the headship the authority of the chain of command not you know to preserve order then god held him accountable responsible first because when god came up to find out what happened why they had were naked and they were ducking and avoiding accountability, being found out. He doesn't go to Eve. If you notice in Genesis 3, he goes straight to Adam out of respect for his office, the chain of command. He says, Adam, where art thou? Later, he does rebuke Eve, them both. But if you look at the respect, I marvel really at the way God handled that as a leader, as their father, as the creator, when they'd done something that big, that bad. And he comes out with respect. He doesn't abuse, demean, accuse, and say, fuss at, Adam, why did you do that? I know what you did, like some people do. Instead, he said, Adam, where art thou? Adam, what went wrong? What's going on? As if he's giving a chance to stand up and man up. One more chance so that maybe he'd want to say, here's what happened on my watch, Lord. Would you forgive me? Forgive me, Lord, and my wife. We both sinned, and instead that humility didn't come out. They tried to get away with it, so God had to act and bring down judgment. I love the fact that Jesus Christ of the New Testament had a father like that, had an authority role model of a non-accuser. That's why he could inherit that trait from the father in Isaiah 11, 2. He would not judge by the sight of his eyes, 11, Isaiah 11, 3. And I love the fact that when we look at all the ministry and all the people that say that Christians are finger pointers, calling down judgment and wrath because of the sinner and the non-believer, that if you look at Jesus Christ and you read about his relationships, his doctrine in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he was alive, he never pointed the finger at anybody except his own father's house that had turned into, morphed into the temple Pharisee religious big system. Other than that, Jesus Christ in Acts 10, 38, went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. So we got to get our points in an accurate, non-accusatory, yet mighty, without condemnation or finger-pointing fashion. You know, there's a religious spirit that can say, you know, I know this and I know that. Jesus was like this, and Jesus was like that. And it could really be, if you look at how what they're really implying is that Jesus was like that, a hate speecher, a con artist, one who named names from their pulpit or their television ministry or radio TV show, you know. 
But if I were to say that if that represented the kind of Christ I found after reading the relationship ministry he had in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'd want none of that, and I don't hang with that crowd. Back to Revelation, the good news. Let's stir up some good news. The dragon was cast down, all the angels with him. Verse 10, John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation. You mean the devil was cast down on earth and now is come salvation? Yes, now is come salvation and strength power, might. Now has come strength and the kingdom of our God perceived, revealed, downloaded, manifesting kingdom of God and the power of his Christ and the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God night and day. You know, back in Joshua's time, they had a scripture in Joshua. Was it Kings? I don't remember where it was, but it said that 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 Joshua was standing before the Lord, and he'd been through a lot on the earth. He was standing with some, you know, things on his garments, and the accuser was crumb trying to accuse him to the Lord when he'd been bold and brave. So that's the kind of relationship defragger that's needed. All our ten relationships, the ten Bible relationships, are accused in some fashion or another most of the time, and that's how all this hurt, envy strife, wickedness happens that results in abuse and damage. Now is come, said this victorious voice, now is come salvation and all it entails. What does salvation entail? It entails, yes, getting born again. Yes, being ready to go to heaven at any given moment or day. But yes, is there to reveal and speak and to heal to guide you, to guard you, to answer your prayer, whether you're male or female, all along the way because of God's presence and power inside your heart that's revealed and confirmed and accurately guided by both reading the Bible, understanding God's holy word, and also being accountable, you know, having fellowship to get some iron sharpens iron. But it said that now has come salvation, the plan, uh, really supernaturally, Who'd have thought that out of the blue, out of symbolic blue of the eternal realm, the Lord would, Holy Spirit would come and interject itself into the society of the Middle East, which was made up of all the trade routes, all the colors, all the nations of Asia, Asia Minor, of Africa, of the Jews, of the Gentiles, of the Pharisees, of the wannabes, of the plain people, of the people that were full of hatred, the people that were really pretty nice and calm, and all these spiritual powers and unseen forces, the spiritual that we wrestle not against, that Paul describes in Ephesians 6. Good news. Now is come. That means now, right now. Back then it started, but we're sort of late getting on the ball, so let's get it going now. Now is come salvation, all that it entails. Now is come strength, God's strength and power in us, for us, through us, forgiving us. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. I want to say it's a perceived kingdom. It is not just God saying, I'm going to set up a kingdom and kick everybody who owns everything off and I'm going to sit on top of it and make them under, you know, that's a worldly perspective. Later that does happen, but right now, other he's not into violence. This is not about physical, natural violence, though it does take prayer. It does take prayer warriors. It does take pulling down prayers and principalities, you know, spiritual violence. But it's not about hurting anybody, using weapons, naturally taking their stuff. Even though immature people, a few people have done that, and it's been futile. So we have to point out, because of the mindsets, the lay of the lands, the weirdness out there, we have to point this out great depth, that people are not, you know, that they're good people and evil people in every kind of religion, true or false. Nobody's perfect, but with the, if you really know the Lord and develop your faith and you're honorable, God will give you grace, and you can understand these things a lot more than you understood about God's power and might and using this in your real life and avoiding temptation, being delivered, all these wonderful things. 
Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, all right? And the power of his Christ for the accuser, the power of his Christ, Isaiah 11, 2 and 3, Acts 2, the Holy Spirit power. Revelation, let's see, Romans 8, 11 comes to mind as a great example of wonder-working power, a great verse for, for to put your faith in to envision. And that is, it says that the same spirit which raised Christ Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal body. Picture that when you have an ache or pain or something that needs to be, you know, a hurt of some kind. Picture the Holy Spirit dynamite, that resurrection power, nuclear fission, whatever it is that's quickening supernaturally, supernaturally. <laughs> and if you know Star Trek and all the inventions in modern times that we see, just picture that, but with Holy Spirit power. Why are we limited? Why are we upset when things are we looking too small? So all this is given us now, right now. It says, next, verse 10, For the accuser, the accuser of our brethren is cast down. He's already been cast down positionally so that he can accuse all he wants, but the church will know how to handle each and every single case. Every individual can understand how to best get around that and avoid being an accuser, avoid being accused, what to happen when you are accused, by just knowing about some of these things and in prayer. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down that power, that supernatural power, the witch-watching, thinking everybody's evil, thinking everybody, making them all feel less than, accusing, backbiting, tail-bearing, disrespecting, bullying, hating, reviling, you know, that type of spirit that looks like it's on every turn, see law. For the accuser back then, hey, listen, I'm not reading the morning news I'm not reading this as today's fresh, brand new. This has been out there for thousands ever since the New Testament was put into its first written form. It's been there, but are we hearing it? Are we heeding it? Are we allowing it if you're a Christian? For the accuser of our brethren and sister and mama and daddy and papa and little kid and stepchild, stepparent, for the accuser of our brother and sister is cast down. Hey, listen. The accuser is nonpartisan. But there is a great accusation spirit out there about that, isn't it? So we just withdraw. We're not going to be partisan. We're going to pray, participate, vote, but not act out by enabling the accuser in our ministry or about any kind of thing as best we know, as best we can, as best we can tell. God, God's, God's mercy on us. For the accuser of the brethren has already been cast down. I would say if you are around doctrines that are accusing, provoke, accusing out in your ministry, that you know about that, I would just use that as one of the, try it for a while, see if they change with prayer. If not, I'd, I'd label them among the, from such turn away fellowship of 2 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, where you're commanded the pure-hearted people from just turn away. Stay away. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God night and day. You're not good enough. You're blamed. You're evil. You're less than. You're not like me. You're a different color. You're too short. You're too fat. You're too round. You're too thin. You don't do this. You're not under the Levitical like like we like you to be. All sort of, a lot of things. Even so on these ten relationships on our ministry, online fellowship.us, the page, ten Bible relationships, you can see that the first relationship that gets accused and under pressure is that with the human and God, but the second one is very important to notice, and that's the human individual and the relationship with themselves. They can get confused down, self-condemning, and they could even have negative self-talk of envy and pride and rivalry like Cain before he killed Abel. Verse 11, and good news, good news, not pitiful, poor me, they're all witches, they're, you know, somebody's going to come usurp my ministry, they're coming, you know, they're going to, it's the end of the world, it's no hope, 
you know, all this stuff, blame shifting, fearful, down, dark. What happened? It says they overcame him. This is the for, the prophetic apostolic foretelling of the end time church, of the church, those who know about it, those who are not too proud to get into this. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Who did they overcome? Him. What? They overcome him. Who's him? The accuser, the deceiver, Satan. How many times have you heard a ministry teach on, sing about, speak about, go on and on about the end times we're going to overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, we'll love not our life unto death meaning you're going to be a martyr, and yes, you might be. But they're leaving off one big, big word, and that is him. They overcome the church, the true church, the committed church of Christ followers, has the internal ability to be instructed to navigate the turf, to forgive when they are unjustly accused when they are persecuted, how to handle it, how to navigate it. And if they do love their life unto death, they pick Jesus and just go to their reward. That's the way it is. But while they're here, if they're not going to go to their reward and be a martyr, then they know how to stand it and handle it with relationships, which try to get under accusation with family, with spouse, with mother, with self, with leader, with fellowship, with pastor, with choir, you name it with people at the grocery store, neighbors. They overcame him. The church has the ability from the inside out, the power and the might, the staying power, the forgiving power, the loving power, the understanding power, the trust power to forgive, to stand up, to man up, human up, to overcome the accuser. If they are tempted to backbite, they know they're not supposed to, so they go to God for help. Lord, help me keep my tongue. If they're about to let a curse word out to their little kid, they pull back and say, Father, forgive me. Give me power of self-control. If they are about to undermine somebody and talk about them and criticize them or teach, you know, or control somebody or abuse somebody, then they pull back because they know it's sin but they have the power of personal self-government. If they have, if they want to be over everybody and be in ministry and have everybody humble themselves under them and be the top dog or the top cat, whatever it would be, they have the ability to trust God for their own authority. And they say, you know what? I want you to be like Jesus, not like me. I want you to hear God for yourself, but because we're human, we might butt heads. Let's have this chain of command that's polite. You respect your boundaries, your turf, when you come in into this ministry, into that house, that business, and then while you're here, you abide on the premises under the top person's rules. God set rules of that house order, but when you leave, you're on your own turf. You go back to your own authority. That's real order. When you're out and about and you see somebody of a different faith, a different look, a different race, you size them up as a, as a person first made in the image of God. Next, you zero in on their character. Are they safe? Are they sane? Are they nice? Are they respectful? Are they intelligent? And you let the Lord lead you and navigate every single relationship individually with great respect. Our ministry advocates ministry-wide real respect for the office of every human being made in God's image. Psalm 139. That would be regardless of political party, because of size or weight, because of gender preference, because of it's everybody, because of race. It would, it would be everybody who's walking, talking as a human, thinking and acting is a human being officially made in God's image. It is up to them and their choices, what they do with it. Accuser free starts with you and me. It goes to the next door, out to the fellowship, and it goes out to the grocery store. Accuser free starts with you and me. Not to be dummy down, not to be lowly, not to be 
infant baby Jesus who never rises up and speaks out, takes a stand against deep injustice, not at all. But you can still do that based on Jesus when he went to the temple money changers. He had zeal for his father's house, but he never organized the disciples outside to scream insults at the temple priests when they went in to, to go to their official office hours. He never used hate speech. He respected all kinds of people. The only ones he ever rose up and rebuked openly were his own people, God's people, who were the Pharisees, into the money-making, famine-chasing, rules-abiding, peace-keeping, and, you know, sort of into their turf-protecting religious rules based on reverential fear of the Lord for all kinds of relationships. So the good news is the battle's been won. The battle's already been won, but did we know about it? Where's this teaching be, being? Let's look at a couple of more for, for thought. It says, Isaiah 10, 27, the anointing breaks the yoke. God says officially in that particular passage given by the national prophet to God's leaders, his temple offices, but also the kings and leaders, princes and princesses of the God's people, of the Hebrew people back then, it says God wants to make your neck so fat with his anointing that no Assyrian fierce nation can take you over. However, you are blocking God's Holy Spirit power and might because of your practices. If you read, when I read the first, I mean, God taught me this. I didn't know about this. <laughs> when I read the practices, I read the first three chapters of Isaiah, the famous, very complicated book, in my opinion. And he said that the practices of the God's temple leaders, the offices of his nation, of his people, were that of mixture, were that of leader mixture, practicing false religion, little g gods, idolatry, and then vanity, simpering vanity males and females, the first three chapters, and he said because of their choices, God's Holy Spirit might and power was lacking greatly in that nation. So we find that right now. We can find that right now in our nation. We're only speaking now, remember, to the Christians, the born-again, you must be born-again Christian types. We want to have a spirit of excellence and God's greatness but not at the expense of others, not at the expense of striving, working it up, but by grace. We want to do it with a respect for all kinds of people, like I said, by discerning boundaries, walking in love. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about my faith or your faith. It's about the Lord and how he witnesses through relationships that does have faith. It takes faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, but faith works with love and where there's no no genuine respect, no genuine relationships. People are not valued. It's only the rules, consciousness, or winning that matters, achieving or building that matters. Then that isn't love. That isn't real faith. Faith works through love. All right? So we have to know what real love is, and that takes time to teach. The Bible teaches us that the kingdom of God suffers violence but the violent take it by force. All right, that means the kingdom of God, who is, he gives you the revelation inside that he wants to bless you or to have you do this, uh, have you do that in your ministry, and then you'll go through all sorts of battles, but it's not an outer violence. It's not means hurting anybody or clubbing them or, you know, dying them permission, not respecting them. It is revealed, but you have to do your inner homework to have God's power, knowing his power and might, knowing the, how to practice the presence of God, pray in the spirit perhaps, how to bind Satan, how to use the Bible, like I said, knowing the, both the scriptures and the power of God. And there's so many different things that tie in with this, I can't get into it. There's the kingdom of God, the power of God, the gifts of the spirit, worship, you name it. There's so many things that we're just pointing out a few topics. We're using, the, we're, we've heard a lot, you know, I've heard a lot all these years all my life about the power of God and faith and, 
this, that, and the other, and ministry, and good teaching, and all of it. I think right now what's working, what's missing is relationships. Real respect at the grocery store, waiting in line. Other people that don't look like you, new people. Other people that are different colors. I think that's the big word, that the byword for now is relationships. Because it ain't our good deeds that's going to get us into heaven. It's not going to please God. It's not going to be our achievement how many bills we paid, how big we had numbers following us on Facebook. It's not about that. It's one by one we choose to accept Jesus and enter the kingdom of God or not. It's one by one we live our life before the Lord and affect other people or not. It's one by one we choose uh, to serve him or not. It's one by one we lay down and die and then stand alone before him or not, to, whether we're going to heaven or not. So we want to be ready and train everyone. That's our thought over here. That's our real thought every single time. No other secret agenda. No other motive. We just want to encourage you, get you excited about meeting the Lord on the final day when you'll be there by yourself. But we do not want to deny the fact that there is needed a power of God's Holy Spirit anointing His power and might which is needed right there that is in the thread from the Old to the New Testament to the resurrection day and then when Jesus comes to get the church for the coming taking way okay the Bible teaches us that everyone who cries Lord Lord will not enter the kingdom of God whether you're a servant leader whether you're God's uh, chosen five-fold office superstar or not that means you too and us too so we're walk, working it out slowly with the Lord's help, it says work out our own salvation. So you've got to hear for God yourself. you got to hear from God. And you have to know that God is busy moving and that he wants to really bring forth his beautiful spotless bride to this generation for the future generations. I like to go through, when I study, you know, through, I'm just doing something for myself, Matthew 16, 19. There's a great scripture about how to winnow out a lot of all this information. Matthew 16, 19 says that God gives you the keys of the kingdom, that whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And years ago, there was a lot of teaching I heard where I used to live on the loot binding Satan, all that binding. Not much loosing, but binding and loosing, I guess, was it of that verse. But I prefer what the Lord is showing me the last many years was the first part of the verse is so helpful. All right, it says, He gives you the keys of the kingdom, that whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. All right, so we can look at the first part, the keys. When you have a sickness, when you have a problem, when you're in a quagmire of relationships, when you have things that look like eternally you're never going to get out of this issue, that is a great time to know about these keys. They were revealed keys, perceived by the Holy Spirit, based on Bible promises and Bible premises. So if I were you today, I'd say, all right, Lord, I'm made in your image, but I'm not made like her. I'm not made like him. I'm not made like that particular kind I'm hearing about or that I've heard about, that I know about. Lord, I want you to tailor make it for what I need to do about my might and my power at this very hour. That's how I would do it, how I do it right now. And so I'd say, Lord, you say you'll give me the keys of the kingdom that whatsoever. All right, so I need the key. What is the key to my mistake that I made, the key to my marriage, the key to my ministry? What is the key to power and might in my own life? And you go to the Lord and let him speak to you. You can go through the Bible you can go through teaching, you can go through declaration, you go through worship, you can go through all these things and then just go through some of the list of the scriptures that I have, begin to pray them, memorize them, and, and so forth. As you're doing it, you're doing it for the audience of one, not to compete, not to compare, not to contrast. And then let the Lord lead you on how to do it and you be your own kind of power and might. Some kind of people with power and might are very powerful, but they're reserved. Some people are more demonstrative and open. I'm pretty reserved. I'm pretty happy. I'm, I, you know, if I'm in a worship situation, I'm more free, but I'm pretty happy being quiet, <laughs> quietly <coughs> led by the Spirit. <clears throat> and so it depends upon, you know, but I know some people have one great leader, one giant leader, 
had a great wild worship team, but he would stand there just tapping his foot. And he said, when I, he was that reserved, he was made like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said, when you see me tap my foot, that means I'm really <clears throat> wildly praising inside. <laughs> and I think that is exactly right. No one should look around. No one should compete and compare. Whatever you feel is your kind of way of demonstrating God's power and might. His Holy Spirit is up to you. That's why I'm not dogmatic <clears throat> into dogma or into pressuring anyone to pray in tongues or not. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you, than you all. He must have been from the deep south. But I do, same as that, and it's been a joy and a blessing and a gift. But it's never something I ever force on myself or anyone else. It's just by grace. So that's another option for power and might. Read the book of Acts. Let's see if there's anything else. i got to close. Part of the interesting way God speaks about power and might and releases it to his church can be different from various styles of preaching and ministry. And part of it, like I said, is the word of God, knowing the scriptures and the power of God and how they both work. But then you can also use music and worship, like David played before Saul, the oppression lifted, people sing anthems and they you know, they get all power from within. The Holy Spirit anointing that breaks the yoke is there. So we want to say that we're going to close without music today on purpose because we had a lot of this to share. But we will have a second part with our worship in the Holy Spirit, power and might. There can be peace of God, peaceful music, restful music, praising music, and then deep music that's solemn, you know, quiet. But then you can go get really like wild and, and really crazy, even rockish type music, because that has a power of might right there. So our we believe in stress relief, that the anointing is for our ministry is stress relief, basically. That's how you can package it or present it. We're for whatever it takes to de-stress, declutter, detox your personal life, your ministry. And then what we do is how we do this, is we just enjoy the peace of God, the comfort of God. But when we can, we'd like to celebrate. We need a worship team, really, to get that part going, to really celebrate, to get the full-fledged, rocking out worship anointing that breaks that stress off. So we are looking for the right persons with the right caliber and the right quality and the right character that are loving family-type persons. Let's close for now. If I omitted anything, I don't I apologize. Oh, I know one more. Let's put a PS. Two places in the Bible mention that the reason Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil. First John 3:18 and then in Hebrews the the, the Son of Man came for the purposes of destroying the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? I would say they're everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere. Everywhere you turn, there is one. So if you have a call on your life, you want to ask God to show you how to, uh, what this means for your life, your call, and then start to pray on it, start to work on that, and start to call upon the power and faith of the Lord. Renew your mind. I don't have much time left, so I just threw it, that as a PS, but who's talking about all this stuff? Where is this teaching that Jesus already won the victory over the accuser, the battle's been won, and he came to destroy the works of the devil when you see too much of that on every hand? All right, and then real respect for every kind of person made in God's image. God bless you and have a great day. This is Tavo D'Arc. We invite you to take time now and pause and rest and then ask the Lord about sowing tithes and love offerings to this ministry so that we can get out there even further and reach more people. God is good. His mercy endures. God bless you and have a great day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.